list of a number of animals that we need to do rechecks on this morning. When these two doctors make house calls, their patients are not always friendly. As veterinarians at California's Sacramento Zoo, Ray Wack and Scott Larson have as many as 550 patients that grow nervous at the sound of their footsteps. Pretty much every patient I work on wants to kill me. For these doctors who also serve on the faculty at the University of California Davis School of Veterinary Medicine, it's just another typical day at the office. But even that's changing. Is the scale set up? With so many species to care for and with zoos playing an increasingly important role in wildlife conservation. Ears are open, eyes are still closed. Today's zoo veterinarian serves as both doctor and defender. I think in an ideal world, there would be no zoos. But I think at the same time, we don't live in an ideal world. And we really need to raise people's consciousness of just how fantastic the animals on this planet are and how critically endangered habitats and diversity is. And we've really got to use zoos to inspire people to protect the wild areas that remain on the planet. For zoo officials across the country, caring for animals and running zoos is growing more challenging and complicated each year. Touch. Touch. And news headlines like the recent tragedy at the San Francisco Zoo are only adding to the long list of questions and concerns. Are zoos safe for both animals and humans? Are they still places to educate and inspire? Or, as some activists claim, are they cruel and unnecessary prisons for wild creatures? In this program, we'll look for answers and address some of the challenges facing this captive audience. Every animal depends on a carefully balanced habitat for survival. When these places disappear, the animals vanish. In the 20th century, habitat losses, over-exploitation of the land, and climate change were the leading causes of species extinction. And the forecast for the century? Scientists say the extinction rate is expected to soar. You have to understand that most of the species on the planet are undescribed. If we have 15 million species on the planet and only less than 2 million of them are described species, then most of the things that we are predicting to go extinct are ones that we've never even gotten to know. Mark Schwartz, a nationally recognized conservation ecologist from UC Davis, says most population growth is projected to occur in developing countries, Asia, Africa, and Central and South America, areas rich in biodiversity. As a result, Schwartz predicts that mammals, birds, reptiles, and amphibians will be particularly vulnerable to extinction in this century. Habitat can be lost for many species, uh, many species that are at risk, not by cutting down the trees, but by moving people right up to that forest border and allowing them or having them exploit the animals that are in the forest. So it may look like an intact forest, it may sound like a, a good forest, but when you go inside, um, there's very few mammals. With habitat shrinking, Schwartz says zoos today are playing a more decisive role in protecting some species. Jane Goodall, the world's foremost authority on chimpanzees, says she has seen huge changes in the mission of zoos. We're seeing more naturalistic habitats. And the more that this happens, the more the zoo can play a role in education because people can get some idea of how the animal behaves normally. That's because the zoos are appreciating the kind of social group the animal should live in, the kind of things it needs to perform at least some of its natural behaviors. Many of the nation's top zoos are now stepping up their efforts to save threatened species. Seattle's Woodland Park Zoo has made a major commitment to field conservation. More than two million dollars annually is budgeted for their conservation programs. What the animals serve here at the zoo is they are our ambassadors. They educate people that come to the zoo. They're, most people are never going to go to Africa to see an elephant. But they come here, they make a connection, and then they can take action to help the animals in the wild. And so we are now getting more people that have never given to zoos before donating to zoos because of our conservation work. What do the lions say? <laughs> When you come to the zoo, you're enjoying the wildlife that we have here, but you're also 
caring about them enough to care to see if their uh, cousins, so to speak, out in the wild are still going to have habitat in the future. There are some species that virtually have no habitat left in the wild. And will we be able to reconstruct some habitat so that somewhere down the road we can release these animals back into the wild? Well, we hope so. But uh, it, it's not true yet. And so zoos are our only defense for those species to, for persistence on, on the planet. Jane Goodall says, however, that maintaining areas that are biologically diverse is possible if local governments increase their efforts to educate their own citizens. Helping the local people, improving their lives, making them feel better about it. Otherwise, they're not going to care about conservation. They're going to care about health and education and clean water. And once they've got those things, then perhaps they can turn around and say, OK, yeah, we get it. We, we do need this biodiversity. We understand if we cut these trees down, it's going to harm the, the watershed and that's going to harm us. And it'll be a sad day if biodiversity is preserved only in zoos. The Association of Zoos and Aquariums, which is the accrediting body that oversees zoos in the United States, has recently begun encouraging local zoos to put more emphasis on conservation and education. In Papua New Guinea, we are now about to protect 150,000 acres of rainforest habitat, and that came from support from zoos. Bald tail lemur. Zoos that do not have the financial capacity to support field conservation projects are partnering with others that do. For example, the Lakipia Predator Prey Project in Africa, uh, where we raise money on behalf of that project, donated every year to the researcher, who then goes out and does the work there. We're working with uh, folks uh, with the conservation of cheetah, we're working with folks for the conservation of bears here in the United States, and then we're also working with government agencies on the San Francisco garter snake. And so our conservation programs range from the world to national to local. Zoo veterinarians are also getting into the act. They recognize the value of working with wild animals in their native habitats. It's really phenomenal to be able to work in country with the animals in the wild, with the people that are dealing with all of these conservation habitat um, type of issues as well. It, it really brings it home um, much more than, than just being here. Having to work in difficult environments uh, really improves your skills. Of course, the primary mission of zoos and zoo veterinarians is to care for the animals behind their own walls. Fortunately, the last 45 years have seen an explosion of knowledge about how to diagnose and treat exotic species. Zoo veterinarians and administrators say it goes back to one person, this man, Dr. Murray Fowler, now 79 years old. Fowler was a pioneer of sorts. In the 1960s, he herded ailing elephants, chased after sick primates, and ultimately provided baseline information for other veterinarians who were entering the field. Still based at the nationally ranked University of California Davis School of Veterinary Medicine, Fowler continues to contribute immensely to the profession today, writing academic textbooks and scholarly papers that help the next generation of animal doctors. Well, the big emphasis now is preventive medicine, where you do things to care for these animals so that they don't get sick. Uh, still, it's a difficult challenge to, to treat wild animals. Fowler's legacy also continues through a veterinary residency program coordinated by the Wildlife Health Center at the School of Veterinary Medicine. Each year, the program offers one doctor a three-year postgraduate program in zoological medicine. They need to be flexible and willing to roll with the punch. Uh, it won't be the same any time. Every time you go out to immobilize an animal, it's going to be different, and you have to be adaptable. I think small zoos have a lot more challenges in terms of... Amy Nicholson just graduated from vet school, but to fulfill her dream of practicing on exotic species, she needs to complete a three-year residency program. When you actually become an exotic animal veterinarian, you've had lots of schooling, lots of training. Absolutely. And then how much do you really know about wild animals at that point? <laughs> I mean, the thing with the medical field that makes it so exciting, and this is in all aspects of veterinary medicine, is that it's constantly changing. Get blood, ideally we're shooting for about six cc's of blood from each bird.
He walked right into my arms. Hi, baby. Keeping animals healthy includes annual physicals. These flamingos are rounded up, weighed, and examined for any abnormalities. Each bird has a health chart, and detailed notes are taken. Before being released to the pond, they are given a vaccine to protect them against the West Nile virus. Medical rounds are done in the animal enclosures because it is safer and less stressful for the animal. The veterinarians stay in close contact with the keepers, the ones who interact with the animals daily. It's not just a, you know, feed and clean. It's every day we're checking them over to make sure everything's okay. We can look at, you know, every part of their body and, you know, through training. It's, it's a big responsibility. Efforts to enrich the lives of zoo animals are now part of the routine. Keepers and trainers work daily to create a more stimulating environment. These behavior techniques can start early in the animal's life. Consider these three Sumatran tiger cubs, born just days ago here at the Sacramento Zoo. With tiger cubs, then, one of their behavioral reactions, if they get nervous, is to actually eat their cubs. That's why we take great care not to leave any of our scent on the cubs or in the den area. We go in, do a physical exam very quickly, and then shift mom back and keep any disturbance to the building at a minimum. And here are the same tigers nearly 18 months later, as young male adults still with mom in the rear den of the zoo. Up, hold. Target training is basically when you have them present a certain part of their body and touch that target. Good boy. Touch it up. Good. Take a good look at your belly. Good. The purpose of target training is to give keepers and veterinarians an opportunity good. to view all parts of the body without the use of anesthesia. This training provides mental stimulation for the animals and it reduces their stress. Enrichment can also stimulate the five senses according to each species' natural history and behavior. Front. Bathing an elephant is not an easy task, but behavior specialists at the Seattle's Woodland Park Zoo also use target training to make their job easier. Foot. Good girl. Trunk down. Abnormal behavior among some species is still evident in some zoos, often a consequence of boredom and living in small enclosures. You know, in the old days there were so many places where chimpanzees, for example, would paint their walls with feces. That kind of behavior we saw less frequently, there was less rocking, this kind of stereotypic behavior. There'll probably always be some, even in the wild there's some neurotic behavior. Do you think there's any species of animals that simply should not be in zoos today? Yeah, I think elephants shouldn't be in zoos. I mean, elephants just aren't designed for zoos unless you've got a huge area like some of these elephant sanctuaries. Do you think the trend for zoos will be more towards these large animal parks? I think the large animal parks are definitely going to be a place where you see the larger kind of megavertebrates, elephants, rhinos, giraffes. Those animals that really require much larger areas to roam. Wax says that any new exhibits built in zoos must put the needs of the animals first. Adequate size is essential, he says, to allow the animals to express all their normal behaviors. Zoos are starting to do a much better job of actually quantifying stress in the animals and developing measures that we can tell just how well an animal is doing. It's not good enough for the animal just to survive and just set longevity records, but they also need to, in some sense, be happy where they are. While zoo docs pay house calls to the animal enclosures for most of their work, because it's safer for them and less stressful for their patients, animals must be brought to on-site hospitals for the more complicated procedures like surgery and radiology. Today, a young tiger needs his first annual physical and some dental work. Moving him requires the assistance of several people. A member of the lethal shoot team is first in and ready. The keeper, using target training techniques, coaxes the tiger into a squeeze shoot. Larson injects the tiger with an anesthetic and everyone leaves to allow the animal to fall asleep. It's to reduce the stress on the animal, to reduce the stimulation on the animal. Um, the more they're stimulated, the more they're going to 
fight off. It's like somebody getting anesthetized. If you're poking them, are you asleep yet? Are you asleep yet? They're going to take a lot longer to go to sleep than if everything's quiet, it's dark, then they're a lot more likely to go to sleep a lot faster. The array of drugs used in this profession is extensive. Periodic checks on this tiger reveal an initial problem. She's not breathing all that great. She stopped stretching? No. So a muscle relaxing drug is administered. Once the tiger is stabilized and breathing comfortably, it is carried to the transport vehicle. The shoot team leader escorts the van to the hospital on foot. The large caliber rifle is concealed from public view. Once inside the zoo hospital, the vets monitor the cat's respiration. They quickly secure the mouth with ropes so that they can work inside the mouth without worrying about an adverse reaction from anesthesia. Zoo visitors gather at the large windows that give them a direct view of the surgery suite. The equipment is state of the art. How's your blood pressure doing? It's high. This dental procedure fixes some nagging tooth problems. It's sometimes amazing that they'll have broken teeth, rotten teeth, and they'll just keep on eating and you don't even know. Then it's off to the x-ray for a complete health scan. Sometimes the procedures like this one on a young African lion are far more invasive. A trachea tube is inserted so anesthetic gas and oxygen can be delivered more effectively. Larson says he's careful not to get his arm near the cat's tongue because it's so abrasive. With just the anesthetics we gave, this animal could be down for just 30 minutes or it could be down for two hours. Um, so that's why we watch very closely while we're doing all of this uh, to make sure that he's doing well, that he's not too deeply asleep, but also that he's not starting to come around and react and potentially put any in, anybody in any sort of uh, jeopardy. In this procedure, vets insert a contraceptive device in the lion. The idea is to prevent pregnancy until a proper mate is found for the cat. They attach wire sutures to the device before closing the incision. Part of the reason we're using wire suture is then um, when we come back to take the implant out later, uh, if we're not finding it just on palpation because these things can migrate, we can take a radiograph and the metal will show up on the radiograph. After these hospital procedures, the animals are transported to a holding cage where a reversal drug is administered. It doesn't take long. Good. Let's get out. In the early years, doctors often turned to cowboy techniques to restrain the animals. It has gone from physical restraint to chemical restraint. The least stressful way to chemically immobilize a large animal is by darting it with an anesthetic. Yeah, you know what that is, don't you? The same procedure is used if an animal escapes its enclosure and is considered dangerous. These are darts. The Association of Zoos and Aquariums requires all its accredited zoos to routinely practice an escaped animal drill. And then take aim at your escaped antelope. A little bit low. Zoos teams are comprised of a dart team that tries first to immobilize the animal and a lethal shooting team that fires live rounds with the intent to kill the animal should it pose an imminent risk to humans. In addition to mandating the escaped animal drills, the National Zoo Association and the U.S. Department of Agriculture provide standards and guidelines for animal enclosures. The tragic events that transpired last winter at the San Francisco Zoo, where a tiger was shot and killed after it had jumped from its enclosure and attacked and killed a man, spurred most zoos to review their safety protocols and exhibit designs. The accreditation guidelines uh, give zoos and aquariums a roadmap for designing exhibits, for maintaining exhibits, uh, to make sure that they're safe for the animals as well as the keeper staff and the public. Uh, but the guidelines can vary quite a bit because there isn't any one standard way to build a zoo or build any particular animal exhibit. It is the responsibility of the zoo to make sure that the animals are safely contained. Prior to the tiger attack, the lion and tiger grotto in San Francisco looked like this. Well, prior to the, uh, the installation of all the new safety upgrades, originally there was uh, hedges, and then you had a three and a half to four feet high public railing. So you'd see it from a distance at this point. You wouldn't have any of this type of glass. 
Uh, following all the safety upgrades, what we did is we removed all the hedges and the public railing, and we started the construction on the what was the top of the, the moat wall, added anywhere between three and a half to four feet of concrete to get to the guidelines of 16 feet and four inches, which is recommended by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. And then we exceeded their guidelines to go to 19 feet. Since the attack, the zoo has invested $1.6 million in safety improvements including an electrified hot wire to further reduce the threat of an animal escaping. A new loudspeaker system used by many zoos will provide timely information. And new signs have been posted that appeal to the public to respect the animals in their enclosures. Bob Jenkins, San Francisco Zoo director, says visitors want to be as close as they can to the animals. They want to get up close. They want to experience them. They want to smell them. They want to hear them. Uh, they want to see what they actually do. And getting that balance where you're actually melding the exhibit with the visitor's needs is one of the trickiest things we work on. In the world of zoological medicine, there has been a stunning proliferation of information thanks to the Internet helping to spread new research and techniques around the world. We're dealing with so many different animals, thousands of different species. It's impossible for us to know everything there is to know about every animal. And so we really have to rely heavily on our networking capabilities and our abilities to call other veterinarians in the field that maybe have more experience with that species than we do. For example, there is a internet um, chat board that's available just for zoo veterinarians where you can post questions about a particular animal that you're working on and often within an hour get responses from the world's experts on those animals. Because the veterinarians are doing such a good job keeping the animals healthy in zoos, this diverse mixed company of species is living longer and longer. Our care has shifted towards geriatric uh, medicine and so we're you know we're doing more things just like in humans to um, help uh, to support patients that have cancer or have uh, kidney problems um, or have arthritis and so uh, we we work with um, folks that have worked longer with domestic animals to help us uh, develop um, more supportive drugs for that kind of thing and it's it's mostly about quality of life the woodland park zoo here in seattle washington is recognized nationally for its excellence in exhibit design and in educating young people about wild animals and their habitats Zoo officials, ecologists, and zoo veterinarians agree that improving the physical and psychological needs of animals is critical to the mission of zoos in the 21st century. Zoomasium is where kids often go to explore nature indoors. It is the newest addition to the Seattle Zoo. It was designed and built with imaginative play in mind. And it starts with the youngest kids. It starts with that spark and these children that come to Zoomasium that have that kind of innate sense and, and passion for wildlife and all the way up through adults. So we really have an, uh, an obligation, if you will, to provide that kind of continuum of programming so that folks can learn more about the natural world, understand their connections to it, and understand that they ultimately have a responsibility and can take actions that will benefit wildlife and wild places. All right, what do you guys bring for us today? Well, a fossil. I think the educational mission of zoos is critically important. I think that zoos really need to focus on inspiring people to make changes both on a local and global level. The 14-acre Sacramento Zoo, considered small by national zoo standards, still plays a role in education and conservation. As schools in California cut back on environmental education, they are looking to this zoo for help. Partnerships with teachers and school districts have developed, and last year more than 70,000 students visited this zoo. However, financial restraints are the biggest challenge facing zoos today. That and a problem that just won't go away. We have other uh, challenges, uh, some of the animal extremists that would lead people to believe that zoos and aquariums should not exist and, and should be shut down. That is a, a, a very vocal group, but a minority, uh, but it is one of the challenges that we face, but certainly on a day-to-day -day basis for every zoo and aquarium, uh, having the finances to support education programs, conservation programs, and provide a great experience for the visitor is probably the most pressing problem. So the rink did lemur. You didn't get this one. Healy says zoos of the future will be more interactive. 
Visitors will be able to feed the birds, touch the animals, and have a more personal experience when they visit. And I think giving the animal more choices, more opportunities to really exert their normal behaviors is really what you're going to see in the future. Good. Salute. Good. For her part, Jane Goodall hopes that many more absorb what she and others already know, a passion for and commitment to a healthy, diverse animal world. Her greatest source of hope for the future is the energy, desire, and often the courage of young people to change the world. Sometimes it's as simple as creating a situation where they can sit and look into an animal's eyes. That tends to really change the way people think. To order a copy of this program, visit the UC Davis website at www.ucdavis.edu.